Welcome back to Reality Pop's Survivor Top 10s. To celebrate season 42, we are going to highlight some of the most exciting narratives throughout Survivor. Join us as we explore our top 10 multiple season story arcs. Number 10, Tyson, from goofball to mastermind. We first met professional cyclist Tyson in season 18, Token Sheens, where he proclaimed himself Coach Wade's assistant coach. He quickly established himself to be the goofball and set about entertaining his tribe with his antics. Having somebody that can make you laugh in an environment like this where everybody's dirty and tired, I think people appreciate that. You can look if you, can look if you want. It's your show, Tyson. But when it comes down to it, I want that million dollars. Exotic, expensive furs on my shoulder, jewels on these pretty fingers. We're talking big time. I'll wear a tiara, a man tiara. Do they make those? Despite this, his tribe caught on to his threat as a physical player and he was blindsided at Final Eight. Tyson played again in Heroes vs. Villains, but it wasn't until Blood vs. Water in Season 27, after he watched his girlfriend get eliminated on Redemption Island, that his attitude shifted. He flexed his strategic muscles and showed he was no longer the court jester, but a formidable strategist, taking home the crown. That I appreciated her sacrifice, knowing that the reason she left was because of me. Because half of you thought I was too big of a threat, so you voted her out. So I did what I had to. I made the huge moves. I dug around for the idols to make sure nobody else had them. And I won challenges when I absolutely had to. Everything I did was strategic. Nothing was out of malice. And I'm here, day 39, because Rachel made that sacrifice. We were able to watch Tyson's evolution from goofball to mastermind and saw him transform into a committed family man over the course of a decade. Number nine, Cochrane, the nerdy superfan. Cochrane, you didn't even hesitate when you said they've both played two times before. You knew that. Yes, I, I am a fan of the, of the game, so I'm not gonna hide that. I'm, 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 you know, this is an out of body experience for me right now. I have a buff collection at home, so you know, I can play it cool, but it's not gonna work. It's gonna be transparent, so I'll come clean and say, you know, I'm a huge fan and I'm thrilled to see Ozzy and Coach. Cochrane began his survivor story in South Pacific where, despite his deep insight into the game, played a subpar social game and found himself voted out soon after the merge. When he returned for Caramoan, he surprised everyone with his brilliant strategic control of the game and even performed well in challenges. His dream came true when the superfan became a survivor legend, completing one of only two perfect games in survivor history but you know, this is the culmination of 13 years of passion for Survivor, half my life. In high school, I used to wear a buff every night that Survivor was on. I used to pass out a newsletter. I wrote a paper about it in law school. This is an obsession. And the fact that I'm here now is surreal and an honor. Number eight, Wentworth, journey to idol queen. Kelly Wentworth had a humble beginning on season 29, San Juan del Sur, where she was voted out pre-merge after getting a raw deal in a tribe swap. But she returned better and more aggressive in Cambodia Second Chance and shone as the idol queen, using her cunning to pull off blind sides and save herself against impossible odds. Wentworth will not count. Wentworth will not count. Wentworth will not count. Wentworth will not count. Savage. Right, baby. <laughs> ah. Unbelievable. She returned a legend in Survivor Edge of Extinction, but the idol queen was played at her own game when she was blindsided with an idol in her pocket. Number seven, Parvati. Underdog to Black Widow. Parvati is one of the biggest legends of the game, having played across 13 years and almost 150 days in-game. Her secret weapon in the early years was her ability to flirt, but found this only got her so far. There are so many men on this tribe now. It seems like we got all the like really big buff guys. I'm absolutely gonna flirt with them. Get them on my good side. It's what I do best. 
In her second season, Micronesia, we were able to see what a strategic powerhouse she was. She formed the Black Widow Brigade, perhaps one of the most vicious and successful alliances in Survivor history, and finished on top. It's like the Black Widow Brigade. Like all the girls are coming together and we're spinning the guys around as much as we can, just spinning them and spinning them until they don't know which way's up, and then we're devouring them one at a time. She returned again for Heroes vs. Villains with another impressive game and we saw her final performance in Winners at War. She emerged a wizened player, a far cry from the flirtatious young girl in Cook Islands. Number 6, Jerry, from Villain to Hero. Everyone else in the camp is looking at it as if, if we lose today, that's it, we're all going to be sitting ducks and we're going to get picked off one by one. I see it almost as an opportunity to... Uh, finagle my way into the other tribe a bit and mix things up and freak some people out. If they're gonna pick us off one by one, I'm at least gonna cause a big ruckus going down. Jerry was labeled the ultimate villain when she appeared in season two, The Australian Outback. This label centered around her love-hate alliance with Colby, the all-American hero. Their alliance ended when Colby betrayed her and blindsided her at the final eight. Jerry was able to get her revenge for his betrayal when they both appeared in All Stars and was able to contribute to his elimination. Colby doesn't see this coming at all. He doesn't see a single vote coming in his direction. For me, that was a goal that I set for myself was to last longer than Colby. And if it took losing today to get him out of here, I'm totally fine with it. This act made her even more of a villain in the eyes of early Survivor fans. When Jerry returned in season 20 on the Villain Tribe, she was able to shed the labels that were unfairly placed on her and flex her social game. Through this, she truly achieved her redemption arc. She was looking like a threat to win, and for that reason, she was voted out at Final Four. Number five, the Ceree Field story. Sari is perhaps one of the smartest and most inspirational players that we have ever seen on Survivor. We first met her in Panama, where she was underestimated and nearly voted off early. Her strong alliance kept her avoiding elimination until the final four, where it was a fire-making challenge that was her downfall. We saw Sari at her most cunning in Micronesia, where she was a part of the famous Black Widow Brigade. She came up with the plan to convince Eric to give his immunity to another player, resulting in his elimination. What's the problem with me keeping immunity and still voting Amanda? Because I don't, I don't know if I would believe that you would vote Amanda. She made it to the final three and was voted out because she was a threat to win. Suri's reputation as a threat saw her voted out early in Heroes vs. Villains, but in her final appearance in Game Changers, she made it all the way to Final Six until she was heartbreakingly the only option at Tribal Council to be eliminated. This is a historic Tribal Council. Most idols ever played at a Tribal, three. Most people ever safe at a Tribal, five. And the most significant and devastating part of tonight's history-making tribal for you, Sari, is you become the first person in 34 seasons to be voted out simply because there literally is no other choice. Despite receiving no votes against her all season, because of various idols and advantages, Siri was sent home with no votes. Number four, the rise and glorious fall of Russell Hans. My tribe will believe anything I tell them uh, at any point because they're just stupid. An idol king and master manipulator, Russell controlled his tribe in Samoa through cunning and chaos. I plan on weeding out the weak right off the bat. I plan on making it as miserable as possible for everybody. Little stuff like taking a sock. Uh, I didn't burn it in the fire. I think if I can control how they feel, I can control how they think. A villain like we had never seen before, he reached the final tribal council in both Samoa and Heroes vs. Villains, but didn't get the prize. In subsequent seasons, Redemption Island and Australian Survivor Champions vs. Contenders, the other players cottoned on to his reputation and gameplay and voted him out proudly and early. Number three, Boston Rob, the Godfather. 
Perhaps the most famous Survivor player is the godfather himself, Boston Rob. Rob first played back in the fourth season of Survivor as a baby godfather, attempting to control his tribe and their votes. He had limited success and was voted out soon after the merge. You don't have to worry about me. You do what you got to do. You know? It's all on how smart these people are. If they realize if they need you, that's what will keep them loyal. Right? Fear, basically. It's a tough principle. But fear keeps people loyal. If they're afraid they have something to lose, then they'll do what they tell you to do. That's straight out of The Godfather. It's true. When he returned in All Stars, he looked after his future family above all else and played a ruthless and cutthroat game. A spurned jury stood between him and a million dollars, but the money ended up being kept in the family anyway. He butted heads with Russell Hance in Heroes vs. Villains, only to return with him to Redemption Island. In this season, he played his Godfather card, controlled his tribe, and dictated every move from beginning to end. Phillips lobbying for Christina all of a sudden. I'm like, hey, dumbass, aren't you in my alliance? Don't you work for me? Now you're telling me who I should grant favors to? Big mistake, Philip. His final appearance as a player in Winners at War, he attempted to manage his tribe, but the family had outgrown the Godfather and he was eliminated fourth. Number two, Sandra. From winner to winner to day 16 boot. You know, let them kill each other and vote each other off. As long as it ain't Sandra, I'm happy. Another legendary player who has played almost as much as Rob is Sandra. Except Sandra managed to win her season the first time round in Pearl Islands and the second time round in Heroes vs Villains. From then on her fellow players were wary of her subtle strategy and attempts to divert attention away from herself. So when she returned for game changes Sandra had a huge target on her back with talks to eliminate her beginning at day one. From then a day 16 elimination curse began which has followed her to winners at war and even Australian Survivor. I feel I would be wasting my time just for an opportunity to go back into the game, which I'm not gonna succeed at. I got voted out and now it's time for me to go. At the end of the day, I'm still the queen and I'll always stay the queen. Number one, cops are us. Allies turned enemies turned allies. When we first met Sarah in Kagayan, she expressed her suspicions that Tony was a fellow cop. I've been a cop for quite a while, and there is a look that cops have, and Tony's got it. If I'm wrong, he should go be a cop because he looks just like one. Will, will you look at me real quick? Will you be honest with me? Uh -huh. Are you a cop? No, why? You swear? I swear. You look like a cop. I could be a cop if you want. Why? You swear you're well, not? I swear, why? She was right, of course, and so began a friendship, alliance, and rivalry between the two. Having never played a season without each other, these three-time players have been a part of each other's game in every season. In Kagayan, their alliance was strong until the tribe swap, when it all fell apart, and Sarah realized that Tony was no longer an ally. They both made plans to eliminate each other. Tony's plan was successful, and despite expressing her anger towards Tony at the final tribal council, she contributed to his huge victory that season by voting for him to win. When they both returned for game changes, they didn't get an opportunity to work together. However, Sarah credited her win partly to learning from Tony's game a few seasons prior. They were back again for Winners at War, where they decided to bury the hatchet and work together, and Cops R Us became the dominant alliance for the season. So, at the end of the day, we did it. And don't say nothing to nobody. All right, good luck. Their partnership ended when they had to compete against each other in fire making. Sarah lost the challenge and Tony went on to become the second two-time soul survivor. Cops are us. I got you. I got you. Hey, 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 you don't have to be sorry for anything. Hey, listen. I got you. I don't. I want you to enjoy their breakfast tomorrow. And that concludes our list for top 10 multiple season story arcs. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new release content. And why not comment below on which your favourite Survivor story arc is and why, as well as what top 10 Survivor list you'd like to see us do next. And thanks for watching Reality Pop, your hub for all things reality. Thanks so much for watching Reality Pop, your new hub for all things reality. If you're enjoying this content, please let us know by giving this video a like, leaving a comment down below, 
and, of course, subscribing to the channel so you don't miss any videos. And be sure to hit that notification bell along the way. Thanks!